It's good to see everybody here tonight. What we're going to be talking about tonight is the colonial history of South Carolina and the events that led up to the Revolutionary War in South Carolina and the motivations for having the citizens of our state shooting bullets for, back and forth at each other. So the motivations are a little bit varied from uh, the coastal area where we had the Rice Kings to the backcountry area where we had the yeoman farmers uh, who were such a part of uh, Lawrence County, which at that time was part of the 96th district and was also referred to as the Little River District. So to begin with, I'm going to talk a little bit about the geography of South Carolina. We're starting with very early um, pre-colonial history. And it's so important in the Revolutionary War, the uh, river systems in South Carolina, we are blessed to have um, very wonderful free-flowing river systems. Of course, they've been dammed up pretty well now, and a lot of our sites are under different lakes. But I do want you to be familiar with the different river systems in South Carolina. And of course, we know about the Savannah River, um, which is the border between uh, South Carolina and Georgia. So important to this area is the Saluda River. And of course, the Reedy River comes into the Saluda River at Lake Greenwood. And as it joins with the Broad River, this area right here is referred to as the Dutch Fork. Um, the early colonial settlers came from Germany and Ireland um, and Scotland as well. But the Broad River is a um, really big watershed. It goes up into North Carolina. Charlotte drains into the Broad River. And when these two rivers come together, they form the Congaree River. Now, um, also, we have another river that originates in North Carolina, which is the Catawba River in North Carolina. And it flows through the Catawba Indian Reservation, and then it becomes the Watery River. And when the uh, Congaree River and the Watery River join together, that leads to the Santee River. The Santee River Basin is the second biggest watershed on the east coast of uh, South Carolina. The only bigger watershed is uh, Chesapeake Bay. Then we have uh, the Petey River, which runs through. It originates in North Carolina as well. It is referred to as the Yadkin um, River in North Carolina. When it crosses the border, it becomes the Petey. Now, one point of interest I'd like to point out is uh, Lynch's Creek, which is uh, right here, where it joins the PD, that's where Francis Marion had his um, base of operations. This is where Snow Island was. It's a um, seven-acre island in the middle of the swamps that gave protection to uh, uh, Francis Marion. Unfortunately, his location was betrayed by a deserter later in the war, and um, Snow Island was uh, annihilated or ruined at that point. Other rivers down here around Charleston, um, of course you know where the Ashley and the Cooper River are. When they join together in Charleston Harbor, that forms the Atlantic Ocean. So be aware of that. Um, another important river is the Stono River which is just south of Charleston, but that will be part of our um, discussion throughout the course of our um, presentations uh, for the coming year. But one thing I want you to notice in particular about these river systems, if you'll notice, this is the watershed for the Santee River. This is the watershed for the Savannah River. There is a ridge right through South Carolina, which is currently Interstate 26, that goes all the way down to Charleston and eventually becomes uh, King Street in Charleston. This ridge is the Cherokee Path. 
This was a very important uh, commercial byway in South Carolina. The closest town to the Cherokee Territory during the colonial era was 96. And then Kiowe is located uh, in, inside Cherokee Territory. The Cherokee Path extends all the way through into North Carolina where uh, Franklin is and even on to the Little Tennessee River where uh, Fort Loudon was. And we'll be talking about Fort Loudon a little bit later on. But these river systems were very important during the Revolutionary War, particularly where the fords and the ferries were. Because as armies were moving back and forth throughout, throughout the state, the fords and the ferries were choke points. And uh, a lot of the strategy involved with the different op, uh, armies had to do with where these choke points, choke points were. During the uh, Yemassee War, the Catawbas um, associated with or attacked the, uh, the colonists at that time. And the Cherokees came to the aid of the Charles Charlestonians and uh, were able to save the um, colony from destruction. I mean, this, this was a war that went on all along the, the East Coast. The 7% um, of the population of the British colony of South Carolina was uh, killed at that time. And that's a pretty heavy uh, rate of, uh, of death. Um, but th again, they were saved by the Cherokees. And in this map, you can see the Cherokees um, divided how, how their nation was. This shows the lower Cherokees, the middle Cherokees, and the overhill Cherokees. There were three distinct groups of Cherokees. The lower hill uh, Cherokees were in the western counties of South Carolina, in Oconee and Pickens County in particular. There were 16 uh, Cherokee towns in, in those counties. Um, and while the Cherokees did intermingle and trade back and forth with each other quite a bit, they did have different dialects. So there were distinctions between uh, those two groups. This is first contact. This is the first time that Native American tribes in South Carolina, and this is the Winyaws, had contact with European culture. And uh, this is the um, a expedition from Lucas Vasquez de Ayon in um, 1524. First contact. What did Lucas uh, Vasquez de Ayon do as soon as he sailed into Winyaw Bay, which is where Georgetown is? He took 60 captives immediately, took them as slaves into the Caribbean islands. So um, that was the original contact. Two years later, he came back with a colony of 600 colonists. We don't know where he finally settled, but um, that colony lasted for six months and 500 of his 600 colonists, including D'Aelon, uh, died as a result. At first contact with the Europeans, it's estimated that there were 10 million Native Americans in America. By the time of the Revolutionary War, there were 1 million Native Americans in America. The Native American population was just absolutely decimated and wiped out with European diseases, smallpox in particular. Hernando de Soto came through the state of South Carolina in 1540. He ravaged the Indian uh, Native American villages, took their corn supplies for the winter, fed it to his horses, um, just, you know, brutalized the uh, Native American populations. This initial contact set off a 120-year period of just absolute retaliation and retribution 
between the Native American cultures and the European cultures. And when the Revolutionary War occurred, it was a hundred years into this never-ending, non-stop massacre after massacre. It was a brutal time by the time it came to the Revolutionary War, and that was a key factor in the motivations here in, uh, in the back country of South Carolina. The relationship with the Native Americans was poisoned and uh, it was calamity as a result. I apologize for the fuzziness of this um, uh, slide here. No, you don't need glasses. Um, but this is um, a commemoration of the Stono Rebellion. This was in 1739 there was a slave revolt in South Carolina. It's the only slave revolt that occurred in South Carolina, and it was another brutal time as well. The leader of this slave revolt, in this, the Stono Rebellion that happened around the plantations on the Stono River, the leader, there's, there's two different names assigned to this leader. One of the names is Cato, and the other is Jimmy, J-E-M-M-Y. Jimmy was um, uh, captured in the Congo in Africa, which was a um, colony of Portugal at the time. And there was two things about Jimmy that really upset the slave-owning um, plantation owners in South Carolina. One terrible transgression of Jimmy is the fact that since he was from Port, uh, Portugal, Congo, is that he was Catholic. And there was real resentment towards the Catholics in the um, British colony of South Carolina. The other major um, thing that rubbed the plantation owners raw was the fact that Jimmy could read and write. He was taught that um, while he was in, in the Congo. So uh, he was a, a leader, he was charismatic, he um, was preaching the gospel, he was also preaching um, slave revolt. And a group of 50 slaves got together, they slaughtered um, the owners of two plantations, and they started heading south to Florida um, to you know, avoid um, slavery. Well, the local militia then, and the local groups, you know, they got together and they started chasing Jimmy as he was going in his group as they were going down to Florida. And uh, Jimmy and his followers got 50 miles away before they were caught. And when they were caught, they were one at a time beheaded and their heads were stuck on a pike every mile as a warning to other slaves about the consequences of revolt. And at that time, the slave laws were instituted, very strict slave laws. One of those laws was no slaves are to be imported from the, con from the Congo for the next 10 years. But uh, this, the Stono Revolt, was constantly in the back of the mind of the slave owners in the colony of South Carolina throughout the history of the period of, uh, of slavery in the state. Another um, problem that the colony of South Carolina had was the relationship with the French. So this map here shows the French influence in uh, North America in 1750. Now, I will say that this map is misleading. This does show the territory of the French um, possessions, but the French were primarily in New Orleans and um, Quebec and Montreal. Now, while they may have controlled this amount of area, there were only 30,000 Frenchmen in North America. And at this time, there was 
approximately two million uh, British colonists here. So th th that's what throws things off a little bit. This area belonged to Spain. Florida belonged to Spain. And while I'm looking at this map here, you'll see that this gray area here is Indian Territory. It's showing the tip of South Carolina as being Indian Territory. The rest of this area here was Creek and uh, uh, Choctaw. So the French and Indian War, as a result, um, as a subset of the Seven Years' War in, uh, in Europe, was a world war. There was a world war going on in Europe at this time. In 1754, Prussia attacked Austria. And that set off a massive war between the German principalities and England versus uh, Spain and France and uh, Holland. There were massive land battles that occurred in Europe at this time. Set-piece battles with 100,000 soldiers on each side fighting against each other in places that I cannot pronounce the names and I have no idea where they were. But there was five or six major land battles during the Seven Years' War in Europe. As a result of the Seven Years' War, not one single square inch of territory changed in Europe. However, in America, there was extensive changes. The French lost all of this. The Spaniards took Louisiana, but they lost Florida. And the uh, British took Florida at this time. And they took Canada. Canada and Florida went to England as a result of the French and Indian War in, uh, in America. Florida was divided into two areas, West Florida with the capital of Pensacola and East Florida with the capital of St. Augustine. The Spaniards in Florida who had been there for 200 years were given uh, 18 months to move to Havana. So all the Spaniards in Florida moved to Havana and British um, colonists came in. There were only about a thousand British in West Florida and only about a thousand in East Florida. And uh, East and West Florida remained British colonies until 1821. Florida changed hands four times in 60 years. Every 15 years, Florida had a major change in, in ownership. And it's basically nobody wanted Florida. Uh, Florida was desolate until the invention of air conditioning. <laughs> so part of the French possessions was a fort that they had at the juncture of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers um, where the Ohio River begins, and that's Pittsburgh. And this is Fort Duquesne in Pittsburgh. And during the um, uh, French and Indian War, the Cherokees were allies of the British. Now, in 1754, uh, British General Braddock led an expedition against Fort Duquesne. And um, George Washington was, this, was with this force. And George Washington was in his early 20s. And as Braddock approached the fort, the defenders of the fort had word of that, so they sallied from the fort and attacked Braddock about four or five miles from this fort, and they decimated Braddock's army. Braddock was killed, and George Washington, since he was such a young officer, inexperienced in warfare at that time, he was given the position of the rear guard of the British forces. He was guarding the horses and the supply wagons. But as it turns out, as Braddock's forces were decimated and retreating, George Washington was the, was the rear guard, and he set up a defensive 
perimeter and was able to fight off the additional attackers. And it was a very, it was a devastating defeat. But uh, George Washington was able to salvage um, what was left of the British Army as a result of that defeat. Well, that was in 1754. In 1758, there was another attack on uh, Fort Duquesne. And this attack was led by a uh, Indian trader by the name of Richard Paris. And Richard Paris is the first settler in Greenville County, first recognized settler in Greenville County. And we're going Saturday to have a field trip to the site of Richard Paris's plantation on the Reedy River. And that location is the east end of the Liberty Bridge. I'm sure y'all know about the Liberty Bridge in Greenville. Well, um, that's where Paris had his plantation. But before that, Paris was a trader on the um, uh, island in the uh, Holston River, which is presently Knoxville, Tennessee. Paris had a trading um, post at that spot. And he was very friendly with the Overhill Cherokees who were in Tennessee and Western Virginia. He actually had a Cherokee wife at that time and three children by um, his Cherokee wife. And Richard Paris led an attack on Fort Duquesne with the Cherokees. Now here's Fort Duquesne down in here. Uh, Fort Duquesne was very defensible from the river approaches. You couldn't attack their cannons dominated the Allegheny, the Monongahela, and the Ohio rivers. But it was very vulnerable from the landward approaches. And that's why the garrison in 1754 sallied and attacked Braddock before he could take the high ground, which is being shown right here, which is occupied by the Cherokees. And you can tell this is Cherokee because the Cherokees shaved their heads and they left just a top knot of hair with one single feather. When you see depictions of Native Americans and you see that style of, of hair, you know it's Cherokees. The Cherokees would shave the sides of their heads with clamshells. You, they could do that, and that shows how the Cherokees would trade with the coastal um, uh, tribes as well. So, I've talked about the conflicts between uh, the Cherokees and the Native Americans and European culture, and the brutality, the massacres, the retributions that occurred on, on either side. And a primary reason for that was that the Europeans and the Cherokees had such different concepts of, of law and property ownership and almost everything else. They couldn't comprehend how one, one culture thought versus another. Uh, it was a clash of cultures that led to very deadly results. And what happened in the French and Indian War is a perfect example of this class of cultures and how these groups could not understand each other. Here we are, Cherokee allies with the British forces. They captured Fort Duquesne for the British. Well, you know, there's varying stories about exactly what came about. One of the stories is that the governor of Virginia promised to um, uh, give the Cherokees horses if they successfully took that fort. The other story is that after they took the fort, their horses were stolen. So that brings us to the conflict with uh, what happened in Virginia, you know, when Fort Duquesne was taken, and the Cherokees felt like they were owed 30 horses. So they would go to the Virginians and say, what clan did the person who stole our horses, what clan did they belong to? And the Virginians looked at the Cherokees and said, 
Clan? We ain't got no stinking clans. We're all one clan. So as the Cherokees were marching through North Carolina, they realized that, well, you know, it's all one clan. That clan stole our 30 horses. That clan owes us 30 horses. So they appropriated 30 horses. And there's one thing about North Carolinians, they do not like horse thieves. So a battle ensued. There was 22 North Carolinians that were killed. The South and then the Cherokees go back to their native homeland. 22 dead North Carolinians. The governors of North Carolina and South Carolina are highly incensed that the Cherokees had the audacity to kill 22 North Carolinians. So they embargo trade with the Cherokees, and the Cherokees definitely depended on uh, Native American trade or uh, uh, British trade. And um, trade was embargoed. So the, the uh, Cherokees were suffering as a result of this. They went down to Charleston to plead with the governor about what they could do. And the governor was demanding, this was a demand for blood. He was demanding 22 Cherokees be turned over to him, the British authorities, so they would be hanged. It was a demand for blood. So leading men from the Cherokee Nation, about 20, 25 of them, went to Charleston under a flag of truce. How can we work this out? And the governor basically said, we can't work it out, but I'm going to send you an escort back to Kiowa, back to your hometown, so that you're going to be safe because the backcountry settlers are really mad at you guys. So he sent a military escort with 25 or 30 leading men of the Cherokees. About the time they got to Orangeburg, they decided that no, they're not going to be escorting these Cherokees, they're going to arrest these Cherokees. And the Cherokees were bound and marched into uh, the fort at uh, Fort Prince George, which was at Kiwi, the Kiwi lower town. And they were locked in a room for six, 25 people in there, uh, locked in that room inside the fort at Fort Prince George, and it was a standoff between uh, the town, Cherokee town of Kiwi, and the uh, soldiers in the fort. Well, the Cherokees put up another white flag, said they wanted to meet and talk about this particular situation. And Lieutenant Coitmore, who was the um, uh, head of the uh, fort at Fort Prince George, he walked out to meet with the Cherokee uh, leading men about how they're going to resolve this situation. Well, that was an ambush. The Cherokees rose up from the bank of the Kiwi River and they shot Lieutenant Coitmore and killed him dead. And as a result of that, all of the hostages that were in Fort Prince George, they were immediately killed. And the war was on. This is an example of how the clash of cultures occurred there was no um, way to work out the problems with the horses being stolen, the North Carolinians being uh, killed, the Cherokee chiefs being arrested, Lieutenant Coitmore being killed, the hostages being slaughtered. No way to work that out. Uh, Fort Prince George was surrounded for about two or three months before the British colony sent a relief force under... Uh, Archibald Montgomery, uh, and he um, relieved the force at Fort Kiowa, or at Fort Prince George in Kiowa. Now, there was another fort that the British had uh, built in uh, Tennessee. I briefly talked about that. At, um, on the Little Tennessee River, it was 150 miles away from uh, Kiowa. It was through hostile territory. It was still along the Cherokee path. And Archibald Montgomery took his force to go rescue uh, Fort Loudoun. 
And uh, as he got to a place near Franklin, North Carolina, called Echoe Pass, E-C-H-O-E, the Cherokees ambushed him at that point. The first thing they did was they attracted his baggage train, which was lightly defended, and they took and destroyed you know, his baggage train. So he's kind of left hanging there. But with the surrounding ambush, Montgomery could not progress further than that, and he had to retreat. And that left Fort Loudon just completely hanging by itself, undefended, or unprotected. It was surrounded by the Overhill Cherokees at that time. And a negotiation was made. Um, the agreement was that if the British garrison would leave all their weapons in the fort, that the Cherokees would allow them to march back to um, uh, Fort Prince George. Well, as the garrison was marching back towards Fort Prince George, stories vary, but uh, one of the stories is that weapons were found buried in the floor of the fort, thereby you know, negating the agreement that had been made. Another story is that Cherokees were going to ambush these people anyway. It didn't matter what. One story says 23 of the uh, garrison was killed outright. Another one says the entire garrison was killed outright. But whatever happened, the commander of... Uh, Fort Loudon, uh, his name was Demir. He was scalped alive, he was tortured, he was forced to dance until he died. And when he died, the Cherokees stuffed dirt in his mouth, saying, If you're so hungry for land, here, eat all you want. So, um, after that, the British sent about 18 months later, sent another army into the Cherokee backcountry and uh, just, it was complete annihilation. This is under James Grant. And they wiped out all the 16 uh, Cherokee towns in South Carolina, numerous um, uh, towns in uh, North Carolina as well, and just completely chastised the Cherokees. This is the first Cherokee War, or the Anglo-Cherokee War, the war between the British and, and the Cherokees. But I point that out, this was how it was 15 years before the Revolutionary War, and these thoughts and feelings that both sides had against each other did not subside. This is uh, it's a little bit out of order. This is uh, somewhat of what Walter Allen is going to be talking about next Thursday night. And uh, Walter showed me about this. So uh, I appreciate uh, you know, him introducing me to, to this. But this shows the townships in South Carolina that the British created. And this is basically before the uh, French and Indian War. But um, the... Um, the British colonists realized that they were vulnerable to Indian attacks. So that's why they set up these, colon, uh, these townships in this fashion. And this is on the main roads and so forth. This is where the Dutch Fork is, for instance. Um, a, um, one of the guides at Musgrove Mill, in describing this situation, describes those settlers as being meat shields, human shields, against uh, Indian attacks from the, uh, um, against the uh, uh, colonial, col or the coastal colonists. So uh, that brings us to, you know, what is happening in this area here, which is the 96th area, uh, 96 district. This shows the four westernmost counties of South Carolina, Oconee, um, Pickens, Anderson, and Greenville County, which was Cherokee uh, land. In 1755, in the Treaty of Saluda, this area right here was sold to the British government by the Cherokees. 
And the Treaty of Saluda is one of the few treaties with the Cherokees that actually was upheld by both sides. Um, the agreement was that the Cherokees would cede this land if they had an annual shipment of shot and powder uh, every fall so that they could have their winter hunt. And they would, you know, shoot the deer and, and collect the deer skins, and then they would sell those deer skins to the British um, authorities in uh, late either Fort uh, Prince George or in Charleston. 50,000 deer skins a year left from Charleston Harbor going to uh, London as a result of this agreement. And it was held up for the, pretty, for, the, for the longest time. When this area was opened up, this was the frontier of America. The, colon, the uh, settlers had gone as far west as they could till they reached the Appalachian Mountains in areas like Pennsylvania and so forth. The British government would not allow them to settle uh, over the Appalachian Mountains. So the route that they had left was to go south, right here into the 96th district, right here to, to this area. Um, and there were some great folks who came down along with that uh, great wagon tra uh, trail, as it was, uh, the road was called at that time. But there was also the worst sorts of mankind that came down during that time. Highway robbers and brigands and murderers and people trying to escape justice from everywhere else. And there was hardly any presence, um, uh, judicial presence in the back country then. If you had a transgression that you wanted to rectify, you had to go down to Charleston on a week-long journey and then back on another week-long journey to make your complaint against your neighbor if he stole your horse or something like that. And then when the British authorities got around to it, they would send a patrol to try to deal with your problem. By then, your horse could be long gone. So what happened was a movement arose to deal with um, lawless conditions in the back country. And this movement was the regulator movement. And the regulator movement, they were a vigilante group. If they suspected somebody of being a horse uh, thief, they would tie him to a tree and they would whip him till they felt like he had learned his lesson. Um, and, you know, if his wife beat her, they would go beat the guy up, things like that. But it got out of hand, as so many times vigilante groups do. And another group arose in opposition to the regulators, and this was the moderators group. And the moderators and the regulators had such uh, conflicts between each other, they had a standoff um, and almost you know, started shooting at each other. But Colonel Richard Richardson from the Camden District came through, and for the, from the force of his will, he calmed um, feelings down with the, uh, between the regulators and the moderators. And as a result of that, the 96th Judicial District was created. There's 96 right there. A jail and a courthouse was built um, to establish peace and law and order in, uh, in the back country. So those are different things that were going on as long as the history, the chronological history of uh, what was going on during the colonial period. What were the reasons and the motivations for the South Carolina populace to want to oppose British rule? Along the low country, the coastal areas right here, the Rice Kings were a special group unto themselves. They were South Carolina aristocratic wannabes. They were plantation owners. They were owners who had 400 slaves at a time. Henry Lawrence was one of the biggest plantation owners. They resented the British mercantile um, policies. 
Whereas, see, Britain had enemies all over the world. France, Spain, Holland, all of these were enemies with England. And the British government would not allow the rice kings to have commerce with the French in the Caribbean, for instance, or the Spanish or whatever. They controlled commerce. They were buying raw products from the coast, sending them to England, the products would be finished. The deer skins, for instance, they would be made into jackets, sent back to South Carolina. The British had it going on. They dominated commerce. They had a monopoly. And the Rice Kings resented that very much. In the back country, the issues were protection from the Cherokees. The Rice Kings thought there was too much governmental control the back country thought there wasn't enough. In the back country, the number one um, function of government was not provided to the back country settlers. And that number one function is security, safety and security. Did not have that here in the back country. So the 96th district, it was totally divided when the war came about. Half of the back country back here wanted to see the British for protection. The other half thought that through self-determination, they could better protect themselves. And so that was the different reasons for the conflicts that occurred here in uh, the back country of South Carolina.